Boy gains the worst abilities, but is forced to become powerful in another world. If you dig my recaps, don't forget to subscribe and smash that notification bell. A sarcastic and lonely young man named Haruka is thrown into another world against his will. Discovered by a group of goblins roasting a pig, the boy is forced to run for his life as the monsters chase after him. At one point, Haruka makes a large leap forward hoping his plan works. Sure enough, when the goblins reach the spot Haruka had cleverly avoided, they fall into a trap he had dug earlier tumbling into a hole. At that moment, Haruka is left trying to deal with this new universe he's been dragged into all on his own. Flashing back to the day he was teleported Haruka was spending his break time as usual reading his manuas alone. In other words not only was he a loner in his original life but he had to be one in another world too. Haruka had nothing in common with the people in his class. Almost everyone belonged to a group like the delinquents, the popular girls, the autakus, and the class representatives. And the rest? Well they were just the rest. Yes there were people like him who didn't fit into any group at all. That's when everything happened. A golden man magic circle engulfed the entire classroom, ready to whisk everyone away to that crazy new universe. While everyone else had already gone into a panic lazy Haruka took a while to even lift his head and notice the magical phenomenon happening around him. But once he did, instead of reacting like his classmates, he felt excited for a second only to realize another world would probably be a drag after all. So he decided to run away. Or at least he tried, but no matter what he did he couldn't force open the classroom door which for some reason was locked. As everyone was being pulled into the teleportation Haruka still held out hope that he could escape through the ceiling. He finally managed to open the ventilation duct and hoped to slip away, but it seems all his efforts were in vain as the magic circle spread and eventually caught up with him. Soon enough he found himself in a classic all-white limbo-like place the kind that serves as a gateway to another world. The kind where you'd probably find a fat king and his hot princess, the kind no nerd would ever stand a chance with in real life. Speaking of which, there was an old man in that place, seemingly looking for Haruka. He didn't speak with sounds, but rather his words appeared in text bubbles like in a video game. Apparently, he was some sort of god in this world and Haruka's entire class had already been transported to the new world, except for him. So the boy had to hurry up and decide his stats before he could head down. With that, a large status screen appeared in the limbo. Normally, each person would get 50 points to spend on skills and magic, but since this was the old man's first time dealing with 43 people at once the overpowered abilities had already been taken leaving only the worst one. In other words, even though Haruka had hoped to be a mage or a paladin he had to settle for items like contact lenses or villager a set. As for weapons among two-handed swords and deadly bows he ended up with a staff that was basically just a stick. When it came to magic his choices were well-being and walking. Frustrated Haruka Haruka complained to the old man who finally gave in and handed him all the remaining skills before sending the kid on his way. And so Haruka was finally thrown into an ice sky in the middle of a forest with the worst abilities and absolutely no clue how to survive in a place like this. The first thing he saw was his villager a set, but to his surprise the small bag could hold infinite items and inside there were things like contact lenses, a cloak, a ring of the dead soul and a jewel of knowledge. Haruka still thought all these items items seemed pretty useless, but after putting on the cloak, he felt a little more connected to this world. He then tried to check his stats, but quickly remembered that in order to do that he needed to roll two dice, which would determine how many points he had to distribute far from the 50 he thought he would get. However, for some reason the dice rolled an M something he didn't even know the meaning of. Maybe it stood for masculinity, but it wasn't the time to speculate he needed to assign his points. He didn't care about balancing his build, so he dumped everything into the luck attribute. As the stats were calculated, he realized his luck was incredibly high, leading him to deduce that the M on the dice meant maximum. On the other hand, all his other attributes remained terrible. At least he got an extra skill, subjugate, which allowed him to make others follow him. But since he was the last one thrown into this world one of his character conditions was to survive on his own and not be able to form groups. That meant his dream of assembling a party full of girls in this ice sky was shattered too. Nevertheless Haruka decided he needed to find a safe place to stay. But to navigate through the unfamiliar forest he was definitely going to need the contact lenses from his infinite bag. When he put them on he had no idea they had the ability of appraisal 
allowing him to see the name category and usefulness of everything in this world. Surely this skill opened Haruka's eyes to this new reality, making him feel much more aware of what he was doing. With that he gathered edible mushrooms that increased the user's abilities and stashed them in his infinite bag. At that moment he apologized for ever dismissing the villager a set especially after discovering that the bag could also serve as a water bottle. After some more time adventuring Haruka stumbles upon a cave and decides to explore it but not without first asking for forgiveness from the monster that may live in this disguised dungeon, even though he prayed it was just an empty cave where he could settle. Taking a glance at his bag, the adventurer had a magical tent and a lantern so he was halfway to setting up camp. There once he ensured the place was vacant. Next he gathered some branches and leaves to start a fire using his temperature ability to heat it. As he did this the ability evolved into fire magic. In addition he gained clairvoyance perception and and enemy detection. Despite the pleasant surprise the sleep that came over him might have caused Haruka to fall asleep in the middle of this hostile land with only a stick to defend himself. However the exhaustion was so overwhelming that he had to take the risk, and that's how he survived his first day in this unknown world. The next morning he woke up safe and sound because the tent and the lantern had abilities that acted as repellents for both insects and monsters thanks to the recluse title he earned for being the last to arrive in the sky. Putting that aside Haruka felt his stomach growl, so he lit a new fire and tossed the mushrooms and meat he had in his bag over it. With a bit of seasoning to boost the flavor breakfast was soon ready. To top it off he hadn't expected to have cooking utensils in his bag, so he imagined this villager A who had originally owned the equipment must have been a true survivor of the wilderness. Once he had satisfied his hunger, the adventurer had to decide where to go next knowing that at least he had a place to stay. The next step was to find spots where he could gather food as well as improve the security of his shelter. The only issue was the monsters he might encounter along the way. Speaking of which, through his perception ability, he detected two goblins marking his first challenge in this environment. Haruka assessed them to be level 8, which frustrated him even more as he thought these types of monsters would be easy XP for a noob. Nonetheless, he felt the need to learn how to fight as soon as possible, and this might be his chance. So with only a stick in hand, he used his sealing ability which infused the weapon with magic. He figured that if he couldn't have overpower magic, he would become overpower himself. With that Haruka charged at the first goblin, striking it on the head with a stick, and as the poor creature spun around like a bug, he finished it off. The second goblin rushed at the human, but Haruka easily dodged the simple predictable attacks. Finally, he used a bit of his mana to channel energy through the stick and blasted the goblin finishing the job. After the victory, the boy took a break by the river in the late afternoon. Surviving his first battle filled him with pride. Returning home Haruka ate his mushrooms and checked out the wooden club he had taken from one of the goblins. However he found the weapon small heavy and useless. Apparently his stick was enough for now. At least he had leveled up to two which was progress. His stats had practically doubled and he had also leveled up his weapon proficiency skill after pummeling the goblin. Not to mention his sensibility technique which would prevent him from being caught off guard by goblins who might torment him like a damsel in distress. Additionally, he had gained magic coating after imbuing the staff with magic. Lastly, his calisthenics leveled up because he always stretched when he woke up. At least that's what he did this morning. The next day Haruka couldn't bear to eat mushrooms anymore and thought about finding new food, but he imagined the class reps wouldn't approve of him wasting food, so he forced himself to swallow it all. Moving past that he felt much stronger with his level 1 magic coating as it allowed the user to enhance their physical abilities and magical defense. Surely every living soul in this world would line up at the market to snag a skill like that. On top of that his appraisal also leveled up, which made him see question marks at the end of each equipment's name something that in his opinion seemed much worse than before. However not wanting to stress about it Haruka set out to finally rid his diet of mushrooms, desperately searching for a decent piece of meat in this godforsaken world. Once he calmed down he had the idea to use his magic coating giving him the ability to run and jump with much more force not to mention that his attacks had become noticeably faster. With this power the boy went after more goblins and took out two. Feeling confident, he thought he could handle three at once, but as soon as he came across a trio of monsters Haruka retreated and headed back home to train a bit more before diving into such a mess. In the following days he hunted pairs of goblins in the morning and practiced his magic at night. By the fifth day the 
the adventurer could defeat a goblin in a single blow, and he had even decorated his base with magic setting up a gate and everything for protection. One day he finally found a rabbit in the forest, and worked hard to catch the little thing so he could eat some meat after such a long time. With the animal in hand, the starving boy could already hear the sound of the pot sizzling, but his perception shifted his focus in another direction. This time there weren't any monsters around but rather the delinquents from Haruka's classroom. And it wasn't just them. Using clairvoyance Haruka discovered that the class princesses, the muscleheads, the otakus, and the class reps were also nearby. Thinking about that last group Haruka reflected that it might be better to travel as a team. He had known one of the class reps since their first day of school, so perhaps he should just approach them and try a friendly conversation. But he quickly dismissed the idea in favor of his isolation and freedom where no one could tell him what to do. With that resolve in mind Haruka decided he would become the lone master of this world. But before that he needs to hide to avoid being found by the bullies so he throws himself into the bushes. One of them hears a sound and heads straight toward it and all Haruka can do is hope the guy doesn't keep going. Luckily for him a rabbit suddenly dashes out of the underbrush startling the bully and they all convince themselves it was just the animal so they leave. Even though Haruka doesn't want to confront them he stays close to overhear what they're talking about. Not that they're discussing anything particularly useful, as the apparent leader is reminding the others about the incredible figure of the vice class representative, while the rest of the dimwits start naming their own favorites. Since they're focused on talking about the class reps, Haruka recalls how those girls always manage to handle bullies like these. The leader then pesters Tanaka, a student outside their group asking if the girl's skills will actually work for whatever they're planning which makes Haruka think they're using the kid like a Google search. Finally, the leader jokes that the vice rep is waiting for him and soon after they all leave for good. With that Haruka figures the entire class must be upstream, but either way he knows all too well that solitude is the way to go. The biggest issue is that he hasn't managed to gather anything other than mushrooms, but at least he levels up his loner skill possibly because he's avoided any interaction with his classmates. Still, he's only at level 3 probably because he hasn't leveled up the master of none and ventriloquist skills which he doesn't even know what they mean. Without wasting time, he tries to make sense of these abilities. Master of none likely means he can't focus on just one thing enough to master it, but at least he can do pretty much everything in a mediocre way. As for ventriloquist, it seems like a terrible skill, as if it implies he's a puppet in the hands of others. Regardless, he gives up on it for now and decides to eat to clear his head even if it's just more mushrooms as usual. On the seventh day in the early hours Haruka is awakened by the sound of metal clashing and some male battle cries so he assumes it's the delinquents causing trouble again. However as he approaches the noise he sees the nerds fighting off a group of goblins and he can't help but find it amusing though he wonders if he should help since they don't seem to have the upper hand. Using his evaluation skill the protagonist checks if these guys guys need help but realizes they don't. They're all at level 16, and from top to bottom the first is a sorcerer, then a saint a guardian and a shinobi. Clearly they didn't get stuck with useless skills like him, which is why they're doing so well. This reminds Haruka of his class, which had plenty of athletes and promising students the cream of the crop. Thinking about it, he still doesn't understand how he ended up with them. As for the otaku nerds, they must have watched enough ice guy to know how to handle a situation like this. So so Haruka turns to leave but his perception skill picks up on two goblins sneaking up on the nerds from behind. Instantly, the lone protagonist remembers how those guys were always nice to him so Haruka steps in and takes out the two enemies. Afterward, he greets the group. Soon they're all walking together and the guys thank the loner for his help, but Haruka has been out of touch with friendship for so long that he's forgotten how to act in social situations, leaving him unsure how to respond to their gratitude. He leads the group to his cave and they're all impressed by the place's architecture and Dacre especially considering he built it all on his own. Striking up a conversation Haruka asks what happened to the rest of the class and what they were doing in the forest at that hour. The nerds have trouble answering so the sorcerer explains that they were running away. Starting from the beginning everything began when they were all teleported into the forest. Some scratched their heads others pinched themselves thinking it was a dream while some cried like babies. However the nerds were the most comfortable comfortable in this ice sky world, which led the bullies to demand they explain everything about such worlds or else heads would roll. Amidst the widespread panic the class rep called for calm.
calm, but as soon as a horde of goblins appeared no one could handle the situation. Not even the cocky delinquents could withstand the hostile creatures and retreated in the face of danger. The exception once again was the nerds. The guardian with his shield, the shinobi with his katana, the saint with his hammer, and the sorcerer with his spells all of them charged at the goblins. Even the bullies and athletes joined the fight in the end and the threat was eliminated. After their victory, the class rep suggested they find a safe place to stay leading the group to the riverbank. Once there, the nerds used their ice guy knowledge to develop survival strategies and set up a camp. The class reps divided the duties assigning tasks like keeping watch, cooking, and gathering supplies. Thanks to this, the entire class managed to work together, or so it seemed. One day, however, the popular girls complained about having to gather firewood and refused to cooperate. Soon others joined in, and before long the leader had lost almost all the group members. Only the class reps the nerds and a few others remained at the camp, though some were still unmotivated and bored with the routine so they slacked off. Then a goblin attack hit the base, and the nerds already overwhelmed with work had to face the enemies alone. They won but the price was exhaustion. Even so the nerd sorcerer understood the challenge they faced. If they wanted to survive they had to stick together and level up. After all the goblins weren't the only threat. The bullies were too because the sorcerer had seen them forcing another student to pass skills to them like charm, which probably grants control over people and puppeteer, which also suggests control over supposed puppets. In other words, the nerds weren't just leveling up to face external enemies, but the ones inside the camp as well. To keep an eye on the troublemakers, the Otakus followed them deep into the forest and overheard a plan to establish a harem at the camp. They quickly rushed back to warn the class representative, who decided to level up as well preparing to face the bullies head on. However, the bullies had recently learned how to use charm and puppeteer abilities, making the challenge far from simple. Regardless, with great courage, the class rep confronted the rivals like a lamb to the slaughter. But contrary to expectations, all the bullies were swiftly taken down left, unable to move. Without wasting time, the nerds used magic to seal away the delinquent's sinister abilities, and with their harem plans exposed the bullies were forced to flee from the camp. However, it was clear they wouldn't let this slide easily, and they soon returned for revenge. Things quickly spiraled out of control with tents ablaze and panic spreading throughout the area. As if that wasn't enough, the attackers vowed to come back. In the end, the camp was reduced to ashes and the popular girls blamed the nerds for the disaster accusing them of starting a fight with the bullies. The rest of the students jumped on the bandwagon and also blamed the Otakus. The class representative along with a few others who didn't think the nerds were at fault tried to defend them but it wasn't enough. Consequently, the nerds were expelled from the camp as well. Upon hearing this story, Haruka was nearly moved to tears and hugged his comrades for the ordeal they had gone through. He even offered them a mushroom party to gossip and fill their stomachs. In the end, Haruka spent the night with his friends realizing that having company isn't always a bad thing. As dawn broke, he bid farewell to his classmates and Oda asked if Haruka would join them as they were planning to follow the river in search of a city to become adventurers. The loner admitted that there was no one else in this ice guy with whom he'd want to team up, but in his usual mysterious way he declined the offer and told the boys to leave. Watching the nerds walk away Haruka reflected that his weak skills would only slow them down. Setting that aside he decided to track down the class reps to get to the bottom of the situation. During his search he encountered a kobold got bitten but managed to defeat the creature by hitting it on the head. As he continued his trek, he reached his class's destroyed campsite at nightfall. His enemy detection ability revealed human footprints crossing the river, so he followed the tracks and spotted the popular girls in the distance. He figured it would have been better to stay home and feast on roasted mushrooms. That was exactly what he was about to do when suddenly the most popular girls in the class confronted him. Haruka ran off, but when he heard one of them say, please stop, he decided to see if that was really what she had said. The popular girl quickly explained that they were looking for the nerds to apologize as they had just realized the gravity of their mistake after all they were only alive because of them. Haruka found it strange that these pampered girls would want to apologize to anyone since that would never happen in the original world, but he informed them that catching up to the nerds at this point was impossible. Still one of the girls asked him to share what he knew so Haruka responded with some tough questions of his own. 
alone, could they get out of the forest? Could they face monsters? Were they really going to find their saviors and apologize, or would they give up? Faced with his harsh words, the girls started crying like children afraid they'd die in the endless forest. They begged Haruka to teach them everything he knew so they could survive and make amends for the mistake of banishing the nerds from the camp. After all this Haruka noticed that his subjugation ability had been activated in the system with the three girls listed as subjugated, the popular leader popular girl A and popular girl B. In other words whether he liked it or not he was now tied to them on this journey by the force of fate. And so as the sun began to rise after hours of walking the three girls followed him like baby ducklings trailing their mother. Haruko was losing his mind over their clueless behavior especially the vacant look in their eyes, fearing the moment when things would escalate when they'd start slaughtering kobolds without hesitation and delivering their crystals like dogs returning a toy to their owner. At least that's how he imagined the subjugation ability worked. In the midst of these desperate thoughts Haruka noticed one of the girls was injured, so he offered her a healing potion. But instead of using it properly, she poured the entire potion over Haruka thinking that was the command. At that moment he realized that if the class rep found out what had become of these girls she'd definitely lose it and there was no way he could face her with her class leader powers. Just as Haruka was contemplating how to undo the subjugation spell the class representative appeared behind him shouting to get his attention. Meanwhile the bullies were plotting to go after the girls who were still lingering around the old campsite. But first they had other problems to deal with. Returning to the protagonist, he tries to call the class representative by her name, but he simply can't remember it. This, of course, deeply irritates the girl who makes sure to express her annoyance loudly and clearly. Shortly after the other class reps catch up clearly out of breath, the leader asks what happened to the preppy girls as they don't seem to be in great shape, but truthfully even Haruka would love an explanation. It looks like his subjugation skill has left the girls looking like zombies. Realizing what's going on the class rep asks if Haruka used the subjugation skill on the preppy girls and he nods somewhat reluctantly. She gets upset because that type of ability is only meant to be used on monsters forcing Haruka to explain that it sort of happened by accident. After hearing that all the girls give him a suspicious look doubting his accidental explanation and for a moment Haruka almost turns into a block of ice under their cold calculating stares. With some effort he manages to wriggle out of the situation and tries to leave but the girl insist that he stop right there. Frustrated Haruka can't believe that this is the solitary life he was promised in this new world. The leader of the reps shakes Shimazaki the head of the preppy girls trying to see if she's okay. After some persistence Shimazaki's eyes return to normal and the class rep calls Haruka back to gather all the girls and discuss what's going on. At least now Haruka is left alone just as he'd wanted from the start. So he thinks about practicing his house expansion skill while he waits. Maybe he could even build a base or something like that. With this goal in mind, he gathers mana into his hands to activate the skill, but instead of doing what he expected the boy is tragically buried in the ground, leaving only his neck above the surface. Naturally, the class rep has to dig him out, so he can explain everything Shimazaki had told her. According to Shimazaki Haruka had come to help them all which makes the girls bow down to thank this merciful man for his assistance. That said, Haruka asks to go home only to be scolded by the girls who demand the help he had promised. The class rep wonders what he meant by going home, so Haruka explains that he has a house one he built with his own hands after being thrown into this world. The girls are thrilled by this revelation, and the leader quickly calls for a new strategy, meeting leaving Haruka on the sidelines once again. The class rep asks how many people can fit in his house to which Haruka responds that if you squeeze six people into a space the size of a tatami mat you could fit about 240, even more if you move the furniture around and people don't mind crowding into the bathroom and kitchen. Hearing this, the girls are fascinated that his house even has such rooms, while the leader is shocked that he's living in a mansion in the middle of nowhere just like that. Regardless, the girls encourage their leader to make the request, so she does politely asking if she and her friends could stay at Haruka's house at least for the night. As soon as she finishes her sentence Haruka can barely believe that this huge group of high 
school girls is about to stay at his place and the thought messes with his head in a way that makes it impossible to refuse. Without delay he leads them all to his home using his location skill to guide him through the dark night. Finally after a long walk the girls are huffing from exhaustion, unable to keep up with the brisk pace set by their host. He warmly welcomes them to his humble abode. Once they catch their breath and realize where they are it becomes clear they've arrived at a mansion in the middle of nowhere. This discovery excites the group of girls more than anything else they've experienced in this hostile new world. Somehow Haruka finds it strange that the girls like his house even more than the nerds did, but now it's time to show them where everything is. As he points out the bathroom most of the girls rush ahead to take a bath throwing their clothes in the air as they go leaving Haruka staring at a scene of dozens of girls bathing together. He realizes that all this time in the forest has turned these girls into wild creatures. And since the place is now full of people Haruka finds his own corner by setting up a tent outside. However just as he's celebrating his solitude he's interrupted by the leader of the class reps who wants to thank him for all the support he's given. After the boys left the girls were incredibly anxious but now they're much calmer. It's amazing what a fancy room some good food and a warm bath can do for the human soul. Despite this, the leader admits that she doesn't feel like she's led her group well through all the terror they've endured. Haruka reassures her saying that she's protected them tonight, but she replies that unfortunately she can't do what Oda and the others can. To that Haruka tells her that she doesn't need to. The nerds were practically made for this kind of environment and they came here knowing exactly how to act. They're the aliens in this world world for that reason. The rest of them have no idea how to survive here, so she shouldn't compare herself to them. This makes her feel a bit better, but she's still curious about one thing. If Haruka can build a mansion in the middle of nowhere, maybe he's the real alien in this story. Haruka is taken aback by her sharp perception. She bids him good night and heads off. After a long while the girls finally get a chance to take a good bath and sleep in a proper bed resting like babies in this unexpected mansion. Haruka, on the other hand, gets the least comfortable spot, but just being quiet in his own corner is enough. Alone with his thoughts about shirt-clad girls, the perverted boy imagines, this is going to be a long night. When dawn breaks again, a girl apologizes for waking Haruka up, but informs him that breakfast is ready. He wakes up startled having no idea who this person inside his tent is and asks if he can sleep for just half an hour more before getting up. The girl crawls closer and teases that it looks like he has no intention of getting up at all. Feeling a bit awkward Haruka tries to change the mood by asking what's on the menu for breakfast. She tells him there are mushrooms and grilled fish which gets him excited considering he spent all these days eating nothing but mushrooms. Without meaning to he accidentally headbutts the girl. As they step out of the tent, the girl tries to recover from the hit while Haruka not one to miss an opportunity skips the apologies and goes straight for the fish. With the first bite his newfound love for the fish became stronger than anything else. The girl representing her group asks if Haruka hasn't been living near a stream to which he replies that he has, but he's only been eating mushrooms and watching the fish swim by because they're too fast and clever to catch easily. Curious, he asks if the girls have an easier way to catch the fish and they proceed to show him their technique which makes the job much simpler. At the riverbank one of the girls uses an electric power that instantly kills the fish. Fascinated Haruka asks her to do it again. When she gathers electricity in her hands Haruka uses his packaging skill to capture the spell and then uses it on the river with his own hands. Delighted he celebrates having caught fish for the first time and on top of that he's developed his own electric magic. Apparently with his packaging ability he can capture any elemental magic and reproduce it in his own way. The girl comments that this seems a bit overpowered to which Haruka adds that it appears to be a combination of the packaging skill and his master of none ability. Still he recalls that he was left left with the worst powers while everyone else got the best ones and controlling that electric magic almost made him wet his pants with excitement. Later Haruka meets with the leader of the girls and asks if she's decided what to do next. She explains that they haven't reached a consensus yet but it seems like everyone is heading to the city. Haruka imagines the girls are trying to catch up with the nerds and they confirm that they need to apologize. The leader emphasizes that it would be important to gain a few levels before embarking on this journey which Haruka agrees with. Since that's the plan he'd like to help. The leader thanks him but clarifies that their goal isn't to chase after Oda and the other nerds. Haruka expresses disappointment as he would have loved to see a showdown between the girls and the nerds with their strong abilities. 
Regardless, he gathers with all of them to begin their training journey. First, he asks what level each of them is at and the ones at the front show they're between levels 16 and 21. Haruka is shocked that the lowest level shown is so high considering he's only at level 7. But keeping his word, he quickly spots three kobolds lazing about in a nearby bush and asks the girls to take care of them since those monsters are only half their level. The girls start stretching and preparing for battle, but when the time comes they are completely defeated. Haruka complains that it was pathetic and the girls grumble that no one warned them the creatures were would bite. A little later instead of enjoying the peace and quiet in the tent, he set up poor Haruka watches as several girls gather inside for a review of the fight instead of being anywhere else. Before long, they leave the tent with their confidence restored, except for the purple-haired girl who woke Haruka earlier. She stays behind to apologize explaining that she was just testing him earlier. When the boys attacked she was almost caught and was left traumatized. That's why she wanted to see if Haruka would harm them, but he proved just the opposite. She adds that she'll wake him up again tomorrow for breakfast. And so the next morning Haruka starts his day with fish while the girls train for their rematch with the kobolds. After training some of them are too exhausted to even stand while others pretend to be sick to avoid combat. Nevertheless those who pushed through managed to defeat the trio of kobolds. After their victory they greet the fallen creatures and begin to think of them as pet dogs. The group leader then informs Haruka that they're ready to head to the city with him but he never said he was going along. Long. Later when everything is set the girls finally depart. Haruka warns the leader that they have no way of knowing what lies ahead, so they need to stay sharp and keep their wits about them. That night in the pouring rain, a student runs frantically trying to escape someone chasing him. After stumbling over a rock, he falls hard to the ground and is soon caught. He screams that he doesn't have the ability the man is looking for, but the pursuer ignores him and attacks. The next day Haruka leads the group through the forest always mindful that the bullies could be lurking anywhere watching them. That's why the leader needs to ensure everyone's safety, and for that to happen the best course of action is to get out of there as soon as possible and reach the city. However it wasn't just the delinquents that could pose a problem during this journey because the forest itself held dangers that weren't easy to overcome. For instance a massive orc suddenly blocks the group's path. Haruka immediately tells everyone to back off and watch closely as he takes on the monster alone demonstrating the move moves they should learn. As the human charges toward it the orc swings its club at him but misses its target. Haruka uses that dodge to gauge the orc's speed. According to what the nerds had said this race had great resistance to physical attacks and the only way they had ever defeated such a creature was through magic. With that in mind, the lone hero opens his menu searching for a spell that might be effective. Among them he finds four elements, the classic elements of fire, water, earth, and air. Haruka had learned this ability and after using packing in so many ways like cleaning the floors in his own house for example. In the end, even seemingly useless techniques could come in handy and Haruka was becoming a master at turning them to his advantage. In any case Haruka wasn't completely alone in this fight, so the orc resumes its attack, smashing a tree where Haruka had taken cover with its enormous club. The next few swings come dangerously close to the human, and before he ends up as minced meat Haruka quickly circles around the orc and whacks it with a stick, causing the poor creature to cry out and collapse to the ground. With this victory Haruka becomes thoughtful having just said that orcs are resistant to physical attacks. Yet he just defeated one with a mere stick. Even the girls come closer to try to make sense of what just happened especially since they hadn't learned anything from that bizarre performance. But since even Haruka couldn't explain what was going on, he promises to fight properly next time and rely on magic. Speaking of next time, the group soon encounters another orc further along the path. This time Haruka decides to test his fire magic against it. He hurls a fireball at the creature and wins the battle leaving everyone confused once again at how easily he's handling these fights. Besides just like before the girls weren't able to learn anything from the combat because this guy was just too overpowered to solve things like normal people. However by nightfall the girls weren't as angry as they had been earlier since
since each of them now had a portion of roasted meat ready to be devoured as they relaxed at an improvised campsite for the night. A little way off Haruka sets up his trap using earth magic to keep enemies at bay in this case an extremely deep pit. His magical tents not only have a monster repellent feature but can also detect presences so the girls would be completely safe. With that taken care of it was time to plot the next day's route using a map he had learned to summon with his evaluation skill. While observing the river's location he's suddenly alerted to the presence of enemies in the area so he rushes to check the situation. From a distance he spots some male figures and assumes they're the bullies making him break out in a cold sweat. But it turns out they're just the athletes who approach Haruka in a friendly manner. Haruka wants to know what they're up to assuming they're after something or someone in the woods. Offended the athletes explain that they're not here for any girl but for Haruka himself. As for the girls they feel they can't trust anyone else in the class. Setting that aside the athlete's leader informs him that there's a skill roaming the forest that's even more dangerous than marionette or hypnosis. Haruka wonders what kind of magic could be more troublesome than those two and recalls the skill called abduction. The athlete confirms that it's exactly that and it's not the delinquents who have it as one might expect but someone from outside. At this Haruka extends his hand threateningly and calls the boys idiots because they hadn't considered that he himself might possess that skill. However, if that's the case the athletes agree, it's a thousand times better for it to be in his hands than the bullies. But they still want to know if the loner really knows how to cast that spell. Embarrassed Haruka explains that in fact he can only use the magic of servitude something the athletes have no clue about. But since it's in Haruka's hands, they trust that nothing too bad can happen assuming the kid probably won't use it for anything very useful. Slightly offended by this statement Haruko warns them not to mess with loners, but the athletes aren't looking for any trouble. In reality they only came to warn the group to be careful with the abduction skill and they'll keep an eye on the bullies lurking in the forest. Finally they ask Haruka to apologize to the girls on their behalf for all the drama that went down at the class camp. With that the boys bid farewell and leave, while the class representative who had been eaves dropping on the entire conversation listened quietly. When morning arrives on the 17th Haruka rallies the team to continue their trek and for some unknown reason the girls seem more cheerful than usual leaving Haruka deep in thought. As he moves away from the group, the class representative approaches him to talk about the conversation he had with Kazakazi's group. Haruka explains that they apologized for everything that happened, but that's not what the girl wants to discuss. In fact, she's the one who apologizes to Haruka in advance taking taking a long time to bring up the subject because it's such a heavy topic. Haruka quickly realizes that she's the one with the abduction skill and this surprises her as she had asked Oda's group to keep that a secret. But now that Haruka knows she wants to understand why he helped her even knowing this instead of being afraid. Haruka doesn't understand why she should be afraid so she explains that this skill allows you to steal the target's ability after you take their life making it the most overpowered and sinister technique of all. It's undoubtedly terrifying. Regarding this Haruka points out that the nerds weren't scared either and they sealed off the puppet and hypnosis skills of the bullies but left the class rep with the kidnapping skill. This means they believed only she should carry that power. The class rep is moved to tears by this and says Haruka is to blame for her crying so much leading him to run away while defending himself from the accusation. However the truth is that she's grateful for everything he's done. Later the group resumes their journey toward the river. Haruka having reached the spot he wanted takes the opportunity to test something he had in mind. Without a second thought he dashes off in a certain direction and activates his magic infusion. He then uses the magic weight skill to lighten his magic allowing him to take an enormous leap into the air jumping from branch to branch until he reaches an incredible height. Obviously he still hasn't learned how to fly no matter how much he's tried so he crashes to the ground nearly losing all his HP. Without a doubt he would have died if not for his magic infusion but at least he figured out the path he needs to follow by playing bird for a few seconds. Later still a bit out of it from the huge fall Haruka tries to explain to the class rep how he returned to the escort all battered up but fails miserably. Regardless at dawn they set off again this time using a much quicker route. Along the way all sorts of things happen like the girls from the class taking a group bath and a trio of orcs chasing everyone at one point. But no matter what the team stays strong and united as they head toward their destination. And after the storm the calm finds 
finally arrives. In other words, they find the exit to the forest and the girls cheer. On the other hand, Haruka remains cautious unsure of what might be lurking in the hills. Checking his menu, he discovers that he learned the skill Air Walk thanks to his little performance from the previous day. Without delay, he tests the technique to see how it works scanning the area to ensure it's safe before continuing the journey with the girls. As he looks around, he spots a group of locals in trouble. However, just because they're being attacked by monsters doesn't mean they're good people so Haruka considers not helping them. On the other hand, the girls vote to rescue those people, and the class rep commits to fighting that group if they turn out to be bandits. Knowing she'd act that way, Haruka decides to go alone to avoid putting his companions at risk. To reach the group in danger, he repeats the magic he used the day before to run higher, but this time he adds a small tornado using the wind element to boost his speed. The problem is that the tornado ends up pulling the class rep along with him, and she desperately grabs onto his cloak to avoid becoming a pancake on the ground. But as if that weren't enough, the two realize they won't be able to stop their flight as planned, so they crash near the attacked group's carriage like a meteor. After the dust settles, the native men are left bewildered, though Haruka managed to take down the monsters surrounding them as well as apparently the class rep herself. Soon the leader of the group, a man with black hair, introduces himself as Ofter and another man says his name is Gadak. Haruka wants to know why they were attacked, and Ofter explains that merchants were ambushed by a pack of great green wolves, so the guild put a bounty on the monsters' heads. The group thought they could make some money off it, but from what Haruka could see, they were totally wrong. Regardless, there's no use crying over spilled milk, so Ofter asks everyone to collect what's left of the spoils. Haruka roasts a mushroom for Gadak after the battle, and the local excitedly remarks that they're buff shrooms mushrooms rooms that provide buffs and are extremely valuable. Surprised by this Haruka serves the rest of the group, and soon the girls start feeling as good as new. Watching this for some reason Haruka begins to feel uneasy about these two men being in a group with such beautiful girls. Shortly after the rest of the group catches up to Haruka and the girls are delighted to meet an elf for the first time in their lives. Then they're guided by the locals to the much-anticipated city called Amui. To mark the unique moment, the group draws a line in the dirt to represent the finish line of a new life, and they leap over it jumping toward the future. Meanwhile, the bullies continue leveling up in the forest searching for the girls for the long-awaited showdown. A boy who had been captured by them advises the delinquents to break the seal placed on the puppet and hypnosis skills, but the problem is that to do so they first need someone with the sealing skill. In other words, the bullies need to find the nerds who possess that technique before they can exact revenge on everyone. Strangely, as this conversation takes place the boy accompanying the delinquents lets out a sinister laugh. At the same time, the athletes watch the enemies from afar realizing that nothing good will come of this. 